Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. This video is going to serve as an overview of the balancing act between bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. And these two processes, of course, regulate the amount of airflow into the lungs. And so once we understand this stuff, in later videos, we'll take a look at some of the drugs that can have various effects at different regions of these pathways. But we need to understand the basic physiology first. Before we get into the heavy-duty mechanics of these pathways, let's review a couple of concepts. Remember, bronchodilation is really an increase in diameter of the airways that allow air into the lungs. When would you want more air in the lungs? Well, for example, if you're exercising or if you're in caveman days running away from a predator, right? So basically the fight or flight response. So bronchodilation is going to be favored really by the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, if you're exercising, you need more air going in and out of your lungs. So during that time, it would make sense for the airways to dilate. In contrast, bronchoconstriction is favored by the parasympathetic nervous system. And so this is going to be the rest and digest. This is where you're sitting, relaxing, watching your favorite show on Netflix. And so you don't need as much air going into your lungs. Now this constriction doesn't necessarily mean excessive. It's not like we're closing the airway. But if we go from a dilated position and we decrease the airway diameter to maybe a an average or a normal diameter, that would be bronchoconstriction. Now, of course, sometimes that constriction can be excessive, especially if we have immune mediators, um, so inflammatory cytokines and so on and so forth. But again, we're just talking here about the normal physiology. And there's three main pathways we're going to talk about in this video. That's the adrenergic pathway, uh, the calcium-dependent pathway, and the cholinergic pathway, which is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And in general, all three of these pathways are really going to have some effect on this myosin light chain kinase enzyme. We'll come back to that in just a second. Let's first start by talking about the sympathetic response, sympathetic nervous system. That's what this SNS is here for the sake of space. Now the sympathetic nervous system is going to send branches to the bronchioles and the sympathetic nervous system is going to release norepinephrine from these neurons and norepinephrine is going to be able to activate these receptors. In general they're called adrenergic receptors but the kind that are on the membranes of the cells of the bronchioles are beta 2. I don't have the 2 here but they're beta 2 adrenergic receptors. And so when the sympathetic nervous system activates, it will cause these nerves to release norepinephrine, which then activates these beta-2 receptors. Additionally, circulating epinephrine that's released from the adrenal medulla, epinephrine can also bind to and activate uh, these beta-2 adrenergic receptors. However, the major mode, um, as we'll see of bronchodilation here during the sympathetic response, is going to be through these neurons of the sympathetic nervous system and norepinephrine release. Okay, regardless of which mechanism we have here, epinephrine circulating or norepinephrine from the sympathetic neurons, you're going to get activation of this adrenergic receptor. Now at rest, there's this protein here called a G protein, and it has several subunits. The most important one here is the alpha subunit. Um, and it's just bound to the receptor on the cytoplasmic side. However, when norepinephrine, or as you can see here, epinephrine binds to that receptor, it's going to cause conformational changes in this protein that allow this G protein, the alpha subunit specifically, to dissociate. It's going to move along the plasma membrane here and bind to certain proteins and activate them. One of those proteins here is called adenylate cyclase. If you've been involved in biosignaling at all in any of your studies, you've probably recognized this enzyme. When the G protein alpha subunit binds here to adenylate cyclase, adenylate cyclase becomes activated and it catalyzes the conversion of ATP into this molecule here called cyclic AMP cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Cyclic AMP serves as a second messenger because it's able to, in the cytoplasm here, activate a series of proteins and cascades. Now here we have this enzyme that's right now inactive. This is called protein kinase A. 
and normally it has this other thing attached to it which is called the regulator or the inhibitor. This is basically just another protein that's bound to protein kinase A and keeping it inhibited. So the job of cyclic AMP, now shown here in this pink circle, is to bind to that regulatory subunit right here. You can see cyclic AMP bound, and when it binds to that regulatory subunit, it causes the regulatory subunit to come off of protein kinase A. Now we have a free protein kinase A, and as a kinase, it's going to induce a phosphorylation cascade because it's a kinase. Now, I'm not showing all the steps here, and there's probably many of them. We won't talk about them. But ultimately, that protein kinase A is going to lead to the inhibition. Notice this inhibition arrow right here of myosin light chain kinase. Now, why is that important? Remember the job of the sympathetic nervous system normally is to produce bronchodilation. If we're in a fight or flight response, we want the airways to dilate so that way we get more air in and out of the lungs. Well, myosin light chain kinase is an enzyme that's going to ultimately promote constriction. Okay, So if we want dilation of the airways, then we need to inhibit myosin light chain kinase. Now really what this enzyme does is it initiates cross bridge cycling in smooth muscle. Remember in the airways it's smooth muscle that contracts and relaxes. So if we inhibit myosin light chain kinase, we lower the amount of constriction in favor of more dilation. And this enzyme, myosin light chain phosphatase, actually promotes dilation. Okay, we won't go into the exact mechanisms there. But the whole point is for the sympathetic nervous system to cause bronchodilation, the major mechanism is actually to inhibit bronchoconstriction by inhibiting myosin light chain kinases. These other two pathways right here are going to produce bronchoconstriction. And they're going to do that by activating this myosin light chain kinase. Remember, when this becomes activated, it leads to cross bridge cycling in smooth muscle, and that leads to contraction of the smooth muscle and then constriction. So activate this enzyme, you'll get bronchoconstriction. The first one of these two pathways is going to be that of the parasympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system mainly operates, at least in this region of the body, through cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve. And so the vagus nerve extends some of its branches here to the bronchial uh, cell membranes, where there are cholinergic receptors. And cholinergic receptors are receptors that bind acetylcholine. I don't have that shown here, but basically these neurons would release acetylcholine, which would then bind to the cholinergic receptor and activate it. And once the cholinergic receptor has been activated, there are mechanisms to cause the activation of this enzyme, which is generally soluble inside the cytoplasm of the cell. It's called guanylate cyclase. Very similar to adenylate cyclase, except instead of catalyzing the reaction on ATP, it catalyzes it on GTP, and this enzyme is found free-floating in the cytoplasm instead of being membrane-bound. So guanylate cyclase catalyzes the conversion of GTP into cyclic GMP. And then cyclic GMP here, again another second messenger, has two functions here in the bronchioles. One, it's going to activate this kinase called protein kinase G. Now this enzyme is actually able to directly phosphorylate myosin light chain kinase, which activates it. So again, remember, the parasympathetic nervous system it favors bronchoconstriction because if we're not exercising, if we're just resting and relaxing and whatnot, we don't need as much air going in and out of the lungs. So bronchoconstriction is what we need. And to constrict, we need the smooth muscle to contract. If the smooth muscle is going to contract, we need cross bridge cycling, and that's activated by this enzyme, myosin light chain kinase. The second job of cyclic GMP, which I don't really have shown here for the sake of space, is to come over here and activate these ion channels. So this ion channel is one that relays calcium into the cell. So when cyclic GMP is made, it comes over here, activates this ion channel, and allows calcium influx into the cell. Once inside the cell, calcium is going to bind to this protein called calmodulin. Calmodulin is a very strong calcium binding protein. And when it has bound calcium, as you see right here, it becomes activated. And it's able to come over to this other protein kinase and activate that. In other words, calmodulin with bound calcium activates the calmodulin dependent protein kinase. And this initiates another phosphorylation cascade. But in general, it's going to activate this protein right here, myosin light chain kinase. And so you see here two mechanisms by which 
uh, the parasympathetic nervous system can activate myosin light chain kinase. It can do so through and directly through cyclic GMP where it actually activates protein kinase G or the cyclic GMP can come over here, activate this calcium channel, and you get the calcium dependent pathway for the activation of this enzyme. Either way, they activate this enzyme, which produces contraction of the smooth muscle and therefore constriction. And so we have a really strong balancing act here between bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction. And the major way that this is regulated through these pathways is through either activation or inhibition of myosin light chain kinase. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how bronchodilation and bronchoconstriction are regulated. In the next series of videos, we'll be talking more about specific drugs and how they affect the respiratory system mainly through these mechanisms. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.